Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Sharlin, and today I'd like to talk to you about a very exciting new test that we are offering at Sharlin Health and Neurology. This test is from a company called CND, that's Charlie Nancy David Life Sciences. And it really moves the mark for us in our approach to Parkinson's disease and in distinguishing Parkinson's from certain other specific movement disorders. Let me give you a little bit of a background. Now, Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder, and most of you watching this video probably seen someone with Parkinson's disease at one point or another in your life. If you think about Parkinson's disease, you probably relate Parkinson's to tremor. And that's true. About 70% or more of people with Parkinson's actually do have tremor, and it's what we call a tremor at rest. So when the hand or hands are gently rested, say, on the lap, then the tremor tends to appear, and it's what we call a pill-rolling tremor. It has a certain frequency, it has a certain pattern, and that tremor may actually disappear as soon as the person starts to use their hand or hands. And that's very different from what we call essential tremor, which is not a tremor at rest, but appears as that person starts to move their hands or hold their hand in a certain position. And so the person with essential tremor often says, I struggle bringing a cup of coffee to my mouth without spilling it, for example. But I also want to emphasize that there are other characteristic features of Parkinson's disease. And I really think of it as a home whereby the person appears rigid, they have a slowness or paucity of movement. We call that bradykinesia. They have what's called a masked facial expression. They may, in fact, have difficulty with their voice. It either gets very hoarse or it's almost slurred and stuttered. You may even see some drooling that's part of the difficulty with swallowing aspect of Parkinson's disease. It affects their gait, it affects their posture. There's typically a forward-leaning posture. The gait itself is described as shuffling, but often when the person with Parkinson's disease gets going, they almost seem to speed or race across the ground, which can throw them off balance. Once they stop, for example, if they're gonna turn, then that process starts all over again. As a neurologist observing the person who is walking, who has Parkinson's disease, I often see a imbalance in arm swing where one side of the body that's more affected by their Parkinson's seems to be more rigid, there's less arm swing, the tremor on that side may be visible, but again, tremor does not always have to be present on exam for the person to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Now I'm gonna be doing a much bigger series on Parkinson's disease and related disorders at a later time. What I do want to share with you today is just a general overview of what Parkinson's looks like. Because a lot of times the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and I should say this is, in my experience, is very frustrating to a lot of patients. The diagnosis is really one that comes out of a good history and physical. In other words, it's really almost what the neurologist observes at the bedside or in the room, in the exam room, to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's rather than a specific test. I know many of you who are watching this video prefer treatment that does not involve medication, but I do want to make a point about a specific medication called levodopa, herbidopa, or Cinemet. This really is the gold standard for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And so oftentimes when the neurologist suspects the diagnosis of Parkinson's, they will actually prescribe this drug and a robust response to levodopa, at least early on in the disease, really supports the suspicion of the diagnosis. So I call that a diagnostic slash therapeutic challenge. But here's the rub. It turns out that 
Well, oftentimes a neurologist with a keen eye can identify the person with Parkinson's disease in the exam room, make the appropriate diagnosis, and offer the appropriate treatment plan, whether that's conventional neurology involving medication, surgery, allied health professional involvement like physical therapy, occupational, and speech therapy, or the more integrative approach like our brain tune-up program, or some combination of both. However, there are times where the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is challenging. There may even be some hesitation to offer that diagnostic therapeutic drug challenge, so we really look for an alternative to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's related disorders of the brain. Now, why do I say Parkinson's related disorders of the brain? Well, that's because first of all, it's important to remember that Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder. In other words, ultimately what happens in Parkinson's disease is the loss of nerve cells in a specific area at the top of the brain stem called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is dense with nerve cells or neurons that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. And it's said that by the time a person is actually just diagnosed with Parkinson's, so we're talking about early stage Parkinson's disease, they have lost as many as 50 to 80% of their dopamine producing cells in the brain. Now, there can be other neurodegenerative disorders that mimic or have a similar appearance to Parkinson's. They're not exactly the same, but they are neurodegenerative and there are overlapping features. There are other disorders that are not necessarily neurodegenerative, but have some appearance that bears a similarity to Parkinson's disease. For example, it's possible to have a patient come into the clinic with tremor where it's a very complex tremor presentation and the neurologist is not completely sure that whether this tremor is essential tremor or whether it's Parkinson's disease. There are other situations where drugs that are prescribed to treat unrelated conditions such as schizophrenia, such as gut dysmotility where the GI tract isn't moving as it should, or bipolar disorder, just a few examples. But these drugs can over time trigger what is called a drug-induced Parkinsonism. So that's different from the neurodegenerative Parkinsonism disorders. Now the neurodegenerative Parkinsonism disorders include Lewy body dementia or Lewy body disease, and a group of disorders that's sort of lumped together under a broad heading called multiple systems atrophy or multiple system atrophy, sometimes also called multi-system atrophy. Anyway, what characterizes all of those neurodegenerative Parkinsonism disorders is a finding that can be identified under a light microscope or an electron microscope called either the Lewy body, and that's L-E-W-Y, or the protein that the Lewy body is composed of called alpha-synuclein. Now, depending on which of these neurodegenerative Parkinsonism disorders a person might have, the distribution of those Lewy bodies or alpha-synuclein in the brain may be different, but they're all characterized by this alpha-synuclein. What is also very interesting is that alpha-synuclein in what's called its insoluble form, and that's the form that we find in diseases like Parkinson's disease, is found in other parts of the body. Now, I'm gonna focus on the presence of alpha-synuclein in the skin layer for most of the rest of this video, but it's also interesting to note that alpha-synuclein has been found in the digestive tract, and some recent reports suggest we actually may be able to diagnose Parkinson's disease or those at risk for developing Parkinson's disease by doing a stool analysis looking for alpha-synuclein. Now, historically, and really this is up to the present day, if I encountered a patient that 
Mm, I think probably has Parkinson's, or I'd want to rule out Parkinson's because I think maybe this is more likely essential tremor, but I'm not completely sure. Or they might have drug-induced Parkinsonism, not Parkinson's disease. Occasionally, it's very confusing because people who have these psychiatric or bowel motility disorders or are on these drugs like Haldol and Risperidone and things like that, they can get Parkinson's disease. So it's possible to actually have both. But for our purposes, what I'm making reference to is that historically, I would send my patients for a specialized type of nuclear medicine scan. That's called a DAT scan, that's D-A-T or dopamine transporter scan. This is a type of nuclear medicine scan. It goes under the broad term, single photon emission computerized tomography or SPECT. But the, the type of SPECT scan we're talking about is a DAT scan. And this relates to a specific nuclear medicine tracer produced by a company called, well, you've probably heard of it, General Electric. So in order for me to confirm or rule out, say, a suspicion of Parkinson's disease, I have been sending my patients for DAT scans over the years. Not everyone, but the more complicated cases or situations where the person is just not comfortable with that bedside diagnosis and wants more objective confirmation. And again, this scan is expensive. It requires that you go to a specialized type of imaging center. It requires some degree of exposure to radioactivity because it's a nuclear medicine scan. The really exciting news is that I no longer send my patients for DAC scans. In fact, what I can do is a simple, nearly painless procedure in my office that identifies the presence of this insoluble alpha-synuclein protein in the layers of the skin. It's very simple. So we call it a skin punch biopsy. 